David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter 20, Steerforth's Home. I found Steerforth expecting me, but in a, sn but in a snug private apartment, red curtained and turkey carpeted, where the fire burnt bright, and a fine hot breakfast was set forth on a table covered with a clean cloth, and a cheerful miniature of the room, the fire, the breakfast, Steerforth and all, was shining in a little round mirror over the sideboard. I was rather bashful at first, Steerforth being so self-possessed and elegant and superior to me in all respects, age included, but his easy patronage soon, soon put me to rights, soon put that to rights, and made me quite at home. As to the waiter's familiarity, it was quenched as if it had never been. He attended on us, as I may say, in sackcloth and ashes. Now, Copperfield, said Steerforth when we were alone, I should like to hear what you are doing, and where you are going, and all about you. I feel as if you were my property. Glowing with pleasure to find that he still ha that he had still this interest in me, I told him how my aunt had proposed the little exposition that I had before me, and whether and whither it tended. As you were in no hurry, then, said Steerforth, come home with me to Highgate, and stay a day or two. You will be pleased with my mother. She is a little vain and prosy about me, but that you can forgive her, and she will be pleased with you. I should like to I should like to be sure of that, as you are as as you are kind enough to say you are, I answered, smiling. Oh said Steerforth, everyone like everyone who likes me has a claim on her. That is sure to be acknowledged. And I think I shall be a favourite, I said. Good, said Steerforth. Come and prove it. It was dusk when the stagecoach stopped with us at an old brick house on at Highgate, on the summit of a hill. An elderly lady, though not very far advanced in years, with a proud carriage and a handsome face, was in the doorway as we alighted, and greeting Steerforth as, My dearest James, folded him in her arms. To this lady he presented me as his mother, and she gave me a stately welcome. It was a genteel old-fashioned house, very quiet and orderly. From the windows of my room I saw all London lying in the distance like a great vapor, and here and there some lights twinkling through it. I had only time in dressing to glance at the solid furniture, the framed pieces of work done, I suppose, by Steerforth's mother when she was a girl, and some pictures in, in crayons of ladies with powdered hair and bodices coming and going on the walls as the newly kindled fire crackered, crackled and sputtered when I was called to dinner. There was a second lady in the dining room, a slight short figure, dark and not agreeable to look at, but with some appearance of good looks too. She had black hair and eager black eyes and was thin and had a scar upon her lip. It was an old scar, I should rather call it a seam, for it was not discolored and had healed years ago, which had once cut through her mouth, downward through the chin, but it was now barely visible across the table except above and on her upper lip, the shape of which had been altered. I concluded in my mind that she was about thirty years of age and that she wished to be married. Her thinness seemed to be the effect of some wasting fire within her, which found a vent in her gaunt eyes. She was introduced as Miss Dartle, and both Steerforth and his mother called her Rosa. I found that she lived there and had been for a long time Mrs. Steerforth's companion. It appeared to me that she never said anything she wanted to say outright, but hinted it, for example, when Mrs. Steerforth observed more in jest than earnest that she feared her son led but a wild life at college, Miss Dartle put in thus. Oh, really? You know how ignorant I am, and that I only ask for information, but isn't it always so? I thought that kind of life was all hands understood to be, eh? Was on all hands understood to be, eh? It is education for a very grave profession, if you mean that, Rosa, Mrs. Steerforth answered with some coldness. Oh, yes, that's very true, returned Miss Dartle. But isn't it, though, I want to be put right if I am wrong, isn't it really? Really what? said Mrs. Steerforth. Oh, you mean it's not, returned Mrs. Miss Dartle. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Now I know what to do. That's the advantage of asking. I shall never allow people to talk before me about wastefulness and 
and profligacy and so forth in connection with that life any more. And you will be right, said Mrs. Steerforth. My son's tutor is a conscientious gentleman, and if I had not implicit reliance on my son, I should have reliance on him, should you? said Miss Dartle. Dear me, conscientious is he, really conscientious now. Yes, I am convinced of it, said Mrs. Steerforth. How very nice, exclaimed Miss Dartle. What a comfort, really conscientious. Then he's not, but of course he can't be if he's really conscientious. Well, I shall be quite happy in my opinion of him from this time. You can't think how it elevates him in my opinion to know for certain that he's really conscientious. Mrs. Steerforth speaking to me about my intention of going down to Suffolk. I said at hazard how glad I should be if Steerforth would only go there with me. Should I? said Steerforth. Well, I think I should. I must see what can be done. It would be worth a journey, not to mention the pleasure of a journey with you, Daisy, to see the so to see that sort of people together and make one of them and to make one of them. Miss Dartle, whose speaking eyes, whose sparkling eyes, had been watchful of us, now broke in again. Oh, but really, do tell me, are they though? She said. Are they what? And are who what? Said Steerforth. That sort of people. Are they really animals and clods and beings of another order? I want to know so much. Why, there's a pretty wide separation between them and us, said Steerforth with indifference. They are not to be expected to be as sensitive as we are. Their delicacy is not to be shocked or hurt very easily. They are wonderfully virtuous, I dare say. Really, said Miss Dartle. Well, I don't know now. We and I have been better placed than to hear that. It's so consoling. It's such a delight to know that when they suffer, they don't feel. I believe that Steerforth had said what he had in jest, or to draw Miss Dartle out, and I expected him to say as much when she was gone, and we two were sitting before the fire, but he merely asked me what I thought of her. She is very clever, is she not? I asked. Clever? She brings everything to a grindstone, said Steerforth, and sharpens it as she has sharpened her own face and figure these past years. She has worn herself away by constant sharpening. She is all edge. What? A remarkable scar that is upon her lip, I said. Steerforth's face fell and paused for a moment. Why, the fact is, he returned, I did that. By an unfortunate accident. No, I was a young boy, and she exasperated me. I threw a hammer at her. A promising young angel I must have been. I was deeply sorry to have touched on such a painful theme, but that was useless now. And I have no doubt she loves you like a brother, said I, <laughs> retorted Steerforth, looking at the fire. Some brothers are not loved over much, and some love, but help yourself, Copperfield. When the evening was pretty far spent, and a tray of glasses and decanters came in, Steerforth promised over the fire that he would seriously think of going down into the country with me. There was no hurry, he said, a week hence would do, and his mother's hospitab hospi ah, and his mother hospitably said the same, and that is the end of chapter 20.